Hi guys, you again with committee today. It's a rainy day in Kyiv, and uh, in studio we have Victor and, uh, and Elena. And from the other side we have, I think, very interesting person, man who co-founded the Agile Manifesto and invented uh, clean coding. It's a nightmare for developers, and um, first started to promote solid principles. Please beat Robert Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start from the very personal question. Who is Uncle Bob? Oh, my. Um, so, in 1989, I worked at a company where... Um, uh, I, we were working on um, the communications quality of T1 telephone lines. And one of the programmers there gave everybody nicknames. And, and my nickname was Uncle Bob. And he was, he was kind of a short little fellow, and he'd walk around going, Uncle Bob, Uncle Bob, what about this? Uncle Bob, what about that? And I hated it. It, it bothered me deeply, and I, I tolerated it until I left that company. And I left that company to go somewhere else. And then suddenly nobody was calling me Uncle Bob. And, and I missed it in some perverse way. So I, um, I made the mistake of putting it in my email signature. And it kind of caught on. Uh, at that time, I was publishing a lot on, on various news groups and social media. Uh, and it sort of caught on. And I went to a conference a few years later and somebody hollered across the hall, hey, Uncle Bob. And I thought, oh, my God, I've created a monster. Uh, but then eventually I realized that it's probably a good brand and I've kept it. So <laughs> that's the story of Uncle Bob. Okay. Now it's clear. Uh, I think you are very, very, very long time in, I would say, development. Can you can you describe in a few words how development changed over time, for for how? I would say past forty time. years? Yes. <laughs> how it changed over time? Yeah. Well, I mean, I was programming these things when I started, right? I would be punching cards on <laughs> on uh, key punch machines and hoping to get a compile overnight, and of course now. I sit here at my laptop with screens around me and computers around me and iPads and everything like that. And it's entirely different from a physical point of view. The hardware, the hardware has just gone crazy on us. But what's remarkable is that the software is almost entirely the same. So, you know, if statements, while loops, assignment statements, Oh, we've got these, these interesting things called classes now that were invented in 1966. But uh, beyond that, it's all pretty much the same. So I marvel at it. I marvel at the amazing power we now have. And yet the almost, almost non-existent change in what software actually is. So basically, nothing changed. <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the things that we do with our fingers, you know, the, the code that we write, it's all pretty much the same as it was in 1968. <laughs> okay. You know, Java is a little different than C, but not that much different. I'm uh, also uh, a teacher at the university and today actually was my first lecture for the new uh, class about Agile and I was telling them about Agile Manifesto, showing them photos of all people participated and of course you were among them. So uh, could you please share with us what chain of events uh, preceded uh, your contribution and your participation in that famous meeting to create an Agile Manifesto? I'll tell the guys, the students, everyone. <laughs> okay, so, so I'll, I'll start. Um, I won't start all the way at the beginning because that would take five or six hours. But I was a C++ consultant in the 90s. 
And uh, very technical, I, I focused on solid principles and you know design and coding disciplines, and I was I was not really interested in process at all. And my uh, my customers would come to me and say, "Well, what process should we use?" And uh, I you know kind of scratch my head and go, I don't, I don't, "You know, I don't know. I'm a programmer. I don't deal with processes." And they were so insistent about it that I started doing some research. And I stumbled across Kent Beck's work on extreme programming. Now, I had known Kent Beck earlier from the patterns community. Uh, and so I, uh, I, I wrote to him and talked to him a little bit about it. And I thought it was pretty interesting. There was this part in there about test first. I didn't think that was any good. But the rest of it I thought was pretty interesting. And it just so happened that I was in Munich in 1999, and Kent Beck was across the hall from me teaching a class. I was at another room teaching a class. And we met for lunch, and we had a, a little discussion about this thing that he'd done, this extreme programming stuff. And I, I said, you know, we should get together uh, and, and talk about this more. So I flew out to his home in Medford, Oregon, in late 1999 and he and i talked a little bit more about it he showed me test driven development which just blew my mind i i didn't i didn't realize just how impactful that was going to be and we talked about a number of other things and we we planned to start doing some courses so he and i and martin fowler and ron jeffries and a whole bunch of folks started teaching courses on extreme programming and this was right at the height of the dot-com era, right? So everybody was interested in, in putting up a website and doing something with, on the internet. And so we had lots and lots of people coming to these courses. Kent Beck held a meeting in early 2000, which he called the Extreme uh, Leadership Workshop. And at that, at that meeting, they talked about forming an organization that would promote extreme programming, and they decided against it. And I was kind of upset by that, and I said so. And Martin Fowler chased me down after that and said, I agree with you, we should form an organization. And so Martin and I met in Chicago about two or three weeks later, and we sent out an email to a whole bunch of people saying, hey, let's, let's have a, a meeting and in, at this meeting, we'll talk about all of the interesting things about extreme programming and Scrum and a bunch of other processes. And Alistair Coburn was one of the people who was on that invitation list. And he wrote back and said, I was just about to send out the same invitation, but I like your invitation list better. Is it OK if I add my own people? And oh, by the way, I'm perfectly happy to do all the legwork if you will have it in Salt Lake City. And you know, we said, yeah, sure, we don't want to do all that work. So, so Alistair set it up at Snowbird and he added more people to the invitation list. And then, and then this group of people on their, on their own, with their own pay, you know, they're doing it on their own money, flies into Snowbird and we have these two days. And they are, I've been to a number of these kinds of gatherings and usually nothing happens. It's a lot of, you know, discussion and stuff like that. And then everybody flies home and that's it. And that's kind of what we thought was going to happen here. And the exact opposite happened. You know, it, it just kind of went crazy on it. So that's the story of how that happened. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Great. Lena, thank you for touching the agile, agile topic. I think now we are going to run a pool and ask our audience, is actually agile working or is it just a fake? Let's okay. try. Or yes. Is it work or is it fake? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Please show us the pool results. Guys, come on to the slido and void. Scan QR code and uh, you will see the pool and answer the questions. And we will find out is Agile, Agile actually working or not. And we will ask Martin, Robert, why? Uh, hey, two people answered. That's good. 
Let's yeah, it's wait a little that, bit. Yes, yes. Many of you are watching, so please, please scan QR code and vote. Share your opinion with us. Let me also vote. So it's, it's fascinating watching the uh, watching these numbers appear on the screen. Isn't it isn't it terrific that in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of all of this, you know, COVID fear, here we are having a perfectly normal discussion using tools that our industry created. You know, this is us. We're the ones who wrote this stuff. We're the ones who made this happen. And we're sitting here enjoying ourselves uh, across the globe in the midst of a pandemic with our own tools. We all ought to just give ourselves a pat on the back and say, you know what, programmers save the world. Yes, yes, yes. That's awesome. Um, let's let's try to think about the results. Uh, so, I mean, we got a bunch of interesting results here so far. There's 25 people have, have answered. Most people are saying, you know, nice approach, not always applicable, but, you know, generally it works. It's about, you know, not quite two-thirds. Um, and other people say, wow, well, you know, it works, but not for me. <laughs> I like that one. And uh, somebody else says, hey, Agile is something that works, but only with ideal people in, in, in the perfect environment. Uh, okay. So, you know, what is this telling us? It tells us a couple of very interesting things. Number one is that Agile is about 20 years old. And in that 20 years, there have been a number of forces that have taken it in many different directions. So there is no one Agile anymore. It's, you know, this Agile or that Agile or this Agile over here or, or something like that. It's all over the place, which, of course, kind of means that um, you can pick one that you like, <laughs> I guess, yeah, and uh, hope that it works for you. There are parts of Agile that should not be omitted. Uh, and often they are omitted. And, and these things that should not be omitted are the engineering practices, test-driven development, pair programming, simple design, uh, these, these elements of refactoring, these elements of Agile are at the heart of what Agile is from a, from a technical and disciplined point of view. Many folks who do Agile do not do those. They do not follow those disciplines. They do instead the outside of agile, the uh, the quick iteration, customer communication, uh, things of that nature. So, in that sense, you you can have a, a very large variability. Thirty-two people have answered. And what is your favorite thing about agile? My favorite thing about it. My favorite thing about Agile is that it is small. Uh, it's a very simple set of disciplines. There's only like 13 or 14. Uh, they're very easy to understand. It does not require uh, massive amounts of education. Uh, I, a normal person can, can understand what Agile is in, in an hour of simple study. Some of the engineering disciplines take a fair bit of practice and, and uh, time to develop skill at. Test-driven development, for example, takes a, a fairly long time to become good at, but understanding the basics of it is, is fairly straightforward. So what I like about Agile is that it's very approachable, very easy to, to um, understand, and the, the benefits should be obvious once you um, once you have your team following okay thank you and uh, i have one more question uh, about the book uh, clean agile i have not read that completely but i started just lo looking it through and i met an idea that uh, 
uh, programmers sometimes create uh, artificial de delays in shipping the system. Uh, why does it happen and how does it uh, Agile approach that? Well, why do programmers create artificial delays? <laughs> um, sometimes programmers create artificial delays by um, uh, attempting to build too much of the system in advance. Uh, they will be given a set of features and they will try to develop all those features simultaneously. And of course, they get none of them done because they're working on them all simultaneously. They try to come up with the grand system. And that will, of course, slow everybody down. The agile approach is to work on a very few things, one, one or two or three things at the same time, something that the team can, can uh, um, get their arms around and control. And then over a period of short iterations, weeks usually, we get more and more and more done. And then we use that to plan out how much we can get done by a certain date. So we look at our progress so far and we use that to figure out how much more we can get done by a certain date. That's the date that we, uh, we uh, have the business decide they're going to uh, deliver on. And so if we do that well, well, then we're not going to delay things. Why are programmers late? Why, why are programmers always late uh, delivering things? Why do deadlines always slip? And one of the big reasons for this is hope. <laughs> you go into a, a room full of computer programmers and you ask them, you know, how's the project going? Are, are we going to make your deadline? And they're, they're all going to say, you know, it's going great. And yeah, we'll make the deadline until about two weeks before the deadline. And then they're all, their hair is all on fire and they're going, we can't do it. We need many more months. What Agile does is it, it destroys hope early because you're working in short iterations and you get disappointed right away. You see how little get done in each of those iterations. Uh, every week, you see how little gets done, and everybody goes, oh, this is going to take a lot longer than we thought, and hope gets destroyed, realism comes in, and then everybody starts looking at what they can actually do as opposed to what they hope can be done. <laughs> and lots of people think that Agile is a way to go fast. It is not a way to go fast. It is instead a way to know how fast you're going. <laughs> Great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I have um, a special a special question for you regarding the agile. Actually, uh, m most problems in the, in the project, I, in all project, I think it's about people. And uh, what do you think? Uh, are there people that are not uh, capable to work in the agile environment? I think agile requires a lot of flexibility in the mindset. So if people are not flexible, so I suppose they cannot work in the agile environment. What do you think? Well, the word capable is probably the wrong word. Uh, I, think, I think everyone is capable of working in an agile environment, but there are many people who don't want to. <laughs> so, so perhaps, their personality does not lend itself well to working in an agile environment. Um, agile environments require a lot of communication. You have to talk to people. You, you have to program with people. You have to be face to face with people on a daily basis. And there are folks who just don't like to do that. There are several, several kinds of programmers that would rather just be in a, in a room somewhere and be left alone for five months. Uh, but that, that's not an agile approach do that. So I, I think there are people who are more amenable to doing agile than others. I also think there are people who should not be programmers. They, they don't have the um, whatever mental wiring this is that allows programmers to think logically through problems. Uh, there are folks that cannot do that well or, or maybe cannot do it at all. Uh, and they shouldn't be programmed, and unfortunately, far too many of them are. <laughs> and I cannot just keep myself from asking about the future. 
how do you think agile will uh, evolve with uh, with time uh, uh, in what direction frameworks will be evolving and what will be the trend what i hope happens is that agile does not evolve at all agile is a set of principles uh, there's no reason to evolve it uh, except for marketing reasons and, and that's what we are seeing in the industry is that there are marketing organizations that attempt to evolve agile in directions that favor them but agile itself is constant it's a set of of principles and disciplines that we knew 20 years ago and have not changed so i don't expect agile to evolve frameworks well you know i'm of the opinion that we've seen enough frameworks there's 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 been so many of them and especially lately it's hard to find one that's better than another I mean, they all come out pop up oh new framework oh it's so cool and then you realize oh no it's the same as this other one that was out 20 years ago and so i i'm kind of hoping that the framework spin will slow down. I also hope that the language spin slows down. Now, we have too many new languages, uh, and we don't need them. And they're not new. They're not innovative. These languages that are coming out within the last few years are just kind of rehashes of old languages. So I'm getting, I'm getting to the point where I'm kind of hoping that our industry stops the crazy churn and begins to realize that, that very little has changed of substance in the last 30, 40 years. <laughs> thank you. Then that's an interesting thought. Yeah, thank you. Not a popular point of view. But... <laughs> uh, and uh, um, my next question is about clean code. So that's a clean great... Code. Yes, that's a great approach, and we were trying to implement it, not always successfully, to tell the truth, but it's, uh, it's a really, really useful thing. Uh, and uh, uh, could you share with us what uh, uh, events or insights just pushed you to the idea of clean code? How did it appear and evolve? Okay, you have lots of useful stuff there. <laughs> In 1999, I read this book by Martin Fowler, uh, and it rocked my world. Uh, this, this was the first book that I read that presented code as if it were something malleable that can be changed. Most books of the time presented code in final form. This book said, no, no, you can change the form. And that really kind of set me on the course of, of trying to figure out how, how code should look. How, sh how could you take this code and reshape it so that it looked better and better and better? For a long time, I thought, this is not, a, this is not something I should do. I'm not the expert. I should not be the one to to write this book, it's too arrogant, it's too ostentation to write a book like this. And then sometime around, uh, I don't know, 2008, something like that, I can't remember, uh, I thought, well, somebody's gotta write this book. And so I, I wrote a book called Clean Code. And I, I said, at the very beginning of that book, I said, look, this is the way I do it. I, you may not do it this way, that's fine. This is just me. This is the way I like doing it. And you know, I've been doing this for, you know, four or five decades. Uh, maybe you can benefit from seeing how I like to do it. And uh, uh, one more question related to quality. As a delivery manager, I often hear that developers come to me and say that uh, we don't like what we did, like we, we did shit. Uh, and uh, our stakeholders, they do not want the best quality. So uh, they don't uh, give us time, they don't give us money, and they don't want the best, but uh, they say they want a sufficient quality. And it sounds like uh, a trade-off on the quality topic. So uh, how would you advise to approach that dilemma? 
The advice I give to programmers is never ask for time for quality. Simply write quality code. Do not go to managers and say, is it okay if we take an extra month to improve things? Because the answer is going to be no. So don't just don't ask for that time. Take the time when you are um, when you are giving estimates. Make sure that you know what what estimates you are giving and how long it's going to take to do high quality code. And oh, by the way, high quality code is faster to produce than low quality code. So so if you've done your estimates well, you should, you should be able to get done faster if you if you keep your code high quality. The advice I give in general is don't ask for permission. Don't ask for permission to clean the code. Don't ask for permission to refactor. Don't ask for permission to write tests. This is your business, not theirs, right? You are the professionals. You are the programmers. You know how best to do your job. They do not. So you do your job the best way you possibly can and never, never ask for permission. When you ask for permission, what you are doing is trying to shed the risk onto them. That's immoral. They can't take that risk. They don't understand the risk. You understand the risk. You have to take the risk on yourself. That's the way a professional would behave. So you decide that you're going to write high quality code. You decide that you are going to write tests. You decide that you are going to read factor and you take that risk upon yourself as any professional would that's what I, that's the advice i generally give to programmers on that topic uh, robert can you say why why quality never mentioned it in the agile manifesto and why for example scrum never mentioned it testers uh, let's see. In the Agile Manifesto, there is something about quality. Uh, Well-written code over uh, documents, I think, is the, is the one principle or, or something like that. But quality was never strongly stressed in the, in the Agile Manifesto. Uh, code quality was never strongly stressed because we felt that a, an agile team would automatically be focused on high quality. It's kind of the underlying assumption. Scrum never mentioned any kind of engineering discipline at all. Uh, Scrum was, was originally uh, invented by um, people who weren't thinking about code quality. They were thinking about how to communicate with customers and how to measure progress. And that's one of the big down, downsides of Scrum. Now, most people who practice Scrum, well, some of the people who practice Scrum have tried to bring the engineering practices in. So you will see a number of Scrum teams doing test-driven development and refactoring and simple design and, and pair programming, but uh, other, other Scrum teams do not, and they are working at a severe disadvantage because of it. Uh, so you think uh, or you state that, for example, quality is some kind of natural thing in Agile and uh, no need to mention it, correct? Yes, yeah. Uh, Agile, Agile is about a, uh, a team of programmers and a team of business people working together to produce the highest quality product they can. Of course. I mean, where did we get the idea that low quality was okay? <laughs> when, did, when did we decide that it was okay to ship bugs? Okay, uh, but, uh, it's when kind of remarkable the... in our industry, we have set the bar so low that we now expect software to be delivered to us full of problems. <laughs> and we should not. No one should expect that. When you get software from someone, it should work, and it should work as advertised. Okay, but uh, let's try to reverse question. Where in Agile mentioned it that we need to deliver the high quality software? 
I do not believe, I, I'd have to go review all the documents now, but I do not believe it's mentioned in it, it was it was an underlying assumption. It was, um, it was something we went into that meeting simply believing. It's something like uh, uh, working software over, over comprehensive documentation. Yeah, I mean, there's a brief mention in that one line, and I could look up that line, but, but you did not see, in, in, the, in the documents on the, on the Agile Manifesto site, you did not see this massive emphasis on high quality, because it's just part of the underlying assumption. Okay, thank you very much. It's, it's quite interesting questions, because, because uh, a lot of times I heard on the conferences talk about the testing in Agile. Actually, I, I never heard talks development in Agile because it uh, sounds obvious and everybody knows. But in the same time, a really a lot of talks, talks about testing in Agile. And uh, now I, I think it's clear it's by quality by design. But in the same time, I would agree today, today's uh, the uh, level level of the quality is so low and uh, sometimes we really expect software buggy and uh, things like that okay uh, uh, thank you very much um, my next um, question will will be about the clean code and um, during uh, your answer we are going to run a pool so uh, there is an opinion that clean code is uh, something that managers would like to enforce and uh, uh, every time asking developers to write a clean code, but developers just not interesting because spaghetti code is is much easier to write. What do you think about uh, following approach for a clean code? Well, I don't know how you enforce it because I don't know how you measure it. Um, clean code is something that every programmer internalizes in, by themselves. So um, if you're going to have a team produces you know good clean code then that has to be in the heart of the team members it can't be written as a law somewhere now that you know hiring people who have a, a, a desire for professional behavior and clean code is the job of the company the company the employers have to hire the right people we have a problem in our and it's a good problem to have, but it's also a problem. And that is that the number of programmers in the world is growing at a crazy rate. Um, some folks think, and I think, that the number of programmers doubles every five years. And that has an implication. The implication is that half the programmers in the world have less than five years experience. And, and that means that half the programmers in the world barely know what they're doing. <laughs> it, it takes more than five years to become a pretty good programmer. It takes probably 10 years to become a really good programmer. So the vast majority of programmers in the world are not particularly good programmers. And, and one of the reasons for that is that they don't understand what a good program looks like. They have not experienced the pain of a bad program. They don't know the, what the, how, how different working on a good system is from working on a bad system. And most of them are just used to working on bad systems, so they kind of expect that that's the way it's supposed to be. If you've ever worked on a good system, you realize that things can be much, much better than, than, than the way people are used to working. And so, um, that's a problem that we're going to have as long as we are growing at this very crazy rate. It also has this other problem, which is that half the programmers in the world, at least half the programmers in the world, are under 30. Because they all just came out of school five years ago. Uh, and so they haven't developed the, the human maturity, let alone the programming maturity. Human maturity to work in a real project with real deadlines and real business imperatives. There is this there is viewpoint, of course, if you look out at all the programmers in the world, what you see is a bunch of very young people 
And you might come to the conclusion that programming is a young person's game. And this is wrong. The best programmers in the world are in their 40s and 50s, <laughs> not in their 20s. But that's a problem that we're going to have for a, a good long time. Okay, let's try, try have a look on the pool results about the clean code approach. Uh, I'm not surprised that most of the people think that it's quite practical. I'm interested in the in the second one there. Twenty eight percent say it's not always feasible. Now there's there's one case where it's very difficult, which is if you have a vast amount of legacy code. And trying to clean up a vast amount of legacy code is a very difficult problem. And I, I want to give some advice on that. Do not start a project to clean up a bunch of legacy code. Don't go to your boss and say, hey, we need three months to clean up all this code. That project will fail and you will lose credibility. The way you're going to have to deal with legacy code is, first of all, understand that it's going to take a long time to clean it like years, and second of all, it will only get cleaned if everyone on the team changes their attitude. And the attitude change is every time you check the code in, you check it in a little bit better than when you checked it out. Every single time, you make it just a little bit better. You check it out, you do whatever you have to do, you don't make it worse, you do one random act of kindness to it and then you check it back in. If everybody just did that, then the code base would gradually get better and better, and eventually you'd be able to add some tests, and eventually you'd be able to refactor. But don't expect that to happen overnight. It's going to take a good long time. The mess took a long time to make. The mess is going to take a long time to clean up. OK, thank you. You uh, mentioned that uh, probably the best developers are above, above. 40 years old and uh, should have 10 years of the experience. I, I, yes, yes, but in the same time, what do you think about following point of view, I would say business point of view? The business needs a lot of uh, cheap, I would say, and um, not very experienced developers because it's it's clear they need to, to move fast, they need to to deliver as fast as possible and things like that. And actually, uh, when I talk to people about the clean code, I'm not often talk to people about the clean code, but in the same time, people say, guys, I don't have time for clean code. I just need to, to, to write down the code. And it doesn't matter, actually, it's clean or dirt or it's just a piece of... It should, it, 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 at least it should work, and I don't care about other things. I just have no time for that. What do you think? Is it really, <laughs> is it really needed? Why we need clean code? What are the benefits to, to for example, visit, visit the training, trying to, to push your brain to write clean code, to, to use solid principles, or is it just, just code? What is the reason, for example, for, for uh, I would say, usual developer to do to, to so such, such complex things? The reason is to go fast. We, we want to go fast. We, we want to spend as little money as possible writing the systems that we need to write. And the way you do that, of course, is to write the best systems you can, to write the best code you can. Your grandmother told you this you know, when you are five years old, right? If, if there's something worth doing, it's worth doing well. The only way to go fast is to do a good job. It doesn't feel fast because doing a good job never feels fast, but it is always faster than doing a bad job. And every programmer knows this because every programmer, if you've been programming for a year or more, has dealt with a huge mess on their screen that they cannot make progress on because they don't understand it and they don't know all the dependencies. And if they touch it, a million things break and they know it slows them down and they know it slows everybody else down. They know it. Everybody knows this if you're a programmer. 
the only way to go fast is to do a good job and go well. So my message to the, the manager who says, I don't have time for clean code, is that you don't have time for the code to be dirty. You want, you want good, clean code. And oh, by the way, if you hire 10 experienced people, they'll do the job a lot faster than 50 inexperienced people. Uh, just uh, just to be clear, you would like to state that uh, clean code is actually the way to move faster. In yes. the same time, a lot of people think that clean code is the way to move to move slowly because you need to think instead of code. <laughs> and it's not it's not a surprise that a lot of people just coding but not thinking. They don't have time to think. Yes, well, that's kind of you a, know um, this, young, isn't it? <laughs> I need to code, I don't need to think. You know, you can save yourself five hours of coding by thinking for an hour. <laughs> okay, uh, let's say how you can convince, for example, the manager to pay for your classes for the group of developers uh, he is working with. Well, so the customers that I have are, are, are managers who used to be programmers and who understand and now they've hired a whole bunch of younger programmers and they want those younger programmers to uh, use the skills that they learned uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago and they asked me to come in and help them with that problem so that's a good sign i think there are lots of managers out there who understand the issue. And now the problem they have is that they hire a bunch of uh, kids out of college and they somehow have to convince those kids that they really want good, clean code. <laughs> and the kids are all like, oh no, I've got to go fast. That means I've got to just write like crazy. And the managers are going, no, no, stop, stop, stop. Think, do it cleanly, you'll go faster if you do. And the kids don't believe it. Because the kids, you know, they were doing it in school. They were doing it at 3 a.m. after a beer party at college. They were trying to get us in the last minute. Their job's done. Their programming assignments done. They were not working in a distant professional environment in college. And so, so they come into the workplace and they think it's going to be the same. And, of course, it's not. Or it shouldn't be. And I have a question just related to this uh, uh, important topic of testing. Uh, for now, on many projects, I see that uh, the testing is partially or completely man uh, manual. And, uh, of course, we're trying to automate, but, but not, not all of us and not, not completely. Uh, so what's your attitude to manual testing? Will it survive like in some way or we should automate everything and just cl clean up the manual QA? Uh, manual testing is immoral. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a... Uh, it, it's taking human beings and making them do what a machine can do, right? And here we are, we're programmers. We know how to automate things. Why would we allow humans to, to test our software if we can write an automated script to test that software? And the automated script, of course, will be far better and far more reliable and much faster and a heck of a lot cheaper. Why would we allow human beings to test our software if we could write something automated to do it? Now, there are, there are some things that must be tested manually. There are certain things that are uh, gauged by uh, aesthetics, by your eye, and so forth. That's fine. But most of the business rules can be tested automatically, and of course they should. And we should, we should never tolerate manual testing if it can be automated. The, uh, the, the end result, of course, is that if you manually test, the number of people you will need to do those manual tests will grow and grow and grow without bound. And eventually an accountant is going to come in there and go, you have too many people doing this, you're going to have to cut that. It's costing us way too much money to do these manual tests. And then you lose the test. You lose the test that way. So if you do manual testing, you will lose those tests because it gets too expensive. 
And uh, uh, the next question is on a bigger scale. Uh, so um, many, uh, almost all industries uh, have some history, some uh, uh, regulations uh, that uh, are target, uh, that target their uh, ethics, their standards. Uh, and uh, in IT, for now, we don't have some, any strict standards or regulations. Do you think that uh, we will come to that naturally when the explosive growth of the industry, explosive growth of the number of developers will just slow down or uh, there is something we should do uh, and we should uh, manage right now? Oh, we should definitely do this now and, and we probably better hurry. Our society depends on software in ways that it does not yet understand. Look at what we're doing right here. Right here, look at all the software that is in between me and you right now. And all of the people listening, all of that software, not just the, the thing on the screen, but all the internet software and the communications protocols and the switching protocols, just an immense amount of software is, is mediating what we are doing right now. Take a look at your body. How many computers are on your body at the moment? I see, I see phones on your lap. I see a microphone in your hand. Here, I got this thing. <laughs> how, many, how many computers are in this thing? Right? I don't know how many computers are in it. There's an awful lot, right? There's one for the screen. There's one for the, the GPS. There's one for the cellular radio. There's probably a bunch more. But what's really interesting is that the case has a computer in it because the case controls how the battery is charged. How many computers are on my body? Let's see, I've got, uh, uh, oh, I got my car keys here. Yep. Car keys, I have computers in them now, car keys. Here's my headset, my headphones, right? Oh, I've got Apple pods, AirPods. How many computers are in here? Oh, heavens, there's two little things. They each have a computer in them. So does the case, the case has a computer in it. Look around the room, look around your room. How many computers are on the wall? Does your thermostat have a computer in it? Most do nowadays. How about your microwave oven? How about your uh, washing machine and your dryer? How about your telephone? How about your television set? In our society today, no one can do anything without software sitting smack in the middle of it. You can't, you can't watch TV. You can't make a telephone call. You can't drive your car. It's loaded with computers in your car. You can't buy anything. You can't sell anything. You can't pass a law. You can't enforce a law. You can't get insurance. You can't make an insurance claim. There is nothing you can do in modern society without software being smacked in the middle of it. Even your grandmother, if you still have one, is using a software system on a minute-by-minute -minute basis because there's literally nothing you can do in without software being in the middle of it. You and I, our industry, rules the world. Other people think they rule the world, but then they hand the rules to us, and we write the rules that execute in the machines that govern everything. And you and I have no ethics, no stated ethics, no stated disciplines, no stated standards. Our society is sitting on top of a a group of very large group of people programmers who have no stated ethics that's wildly unstable now at some point in time there will be an incident we've seen a few already they haven't quite gotten to the level that i'm fearing but you know there there have been some pretty significant uh, software failures the 737 max is a good example or the volkswagen fiasco where they they cheated the epa machines in california or night capital where they lost a uh, half a billion dollars in 45 minutes there's there's too many of them now to mention at some point probably pretty soon some poor programmer will do one dumb thing and kill 10,000 people at a shot. And when that happens, the politicians of the world will rise up in righteous indignation, as they should, and they will ask the question, how could you have let this happen? And what's our answer going to be? Well, my boss told me it had to be done on Tuesday. If that's our answer, 
then the politicians of the world will hang their heads in disgust and they will start to pass laws and they will regulate us. They will tell us what languages we can use, what platforms and frameworks and books we have to read and signatures we have to get. They'll lay it all out for us and they will impose upon us a structure from above. What we need to do is get there first. We need to know what the disciplines are, what the standards are, what the ethics is. What, what are the ethics of being a programmer? What are the disciplines that we follow as programmers? What do we promise to do as a programmer so that when this incident occurs, and it will occur, and the politicians rise up in righteous indignation, we can say, look, this was an accident, but it was not due to our negligence. Here are our standards, here's our disciplines, here's our ethics. We've enforced them in this way. This was a horrible accident, but we were not negligent. And right now, we could not say that. Right now, we are negligent. <laughs> so are you going to do anything in, in that direction? Maybe uh, after this will be the next big thing after Agile Manifesto creation. Am I going to do anything about it other than yell a lot? I, I do a lot of yelling. I do a lot of writing. That's kind of my role. Uh, I, I am not going to try and organize a, uh, uh, a guild or an organization to govern software. I think that's going to have to come from uh, entirely different people. But I am going to yell about it. I'm going to yell about it a lot. And I have been yelling about it for the last 10 years. And I'll continue to yell about it until, until I stop yelling. <laughs> okay, and what is your message to the modern programmer, to the modern community? My message to the modern programming community. <clears throat> Number one, decide on your ethic. Who are you? What, what kind of programmer are you? Decide on your ethics. Choose a set of disciplines and stick to those disciplines. Don't compromise them for schedules or, or you know, managers who are yelling at you. Stick to your discipline. Right? Make sure you have standards and continually update those standards as you learn. Realize, you young programmers, that being a good programmer takes a very long time. It's not, you know, you can write an if statement, you can write a while loop, big deal, right? Understanding how to structure large organ large applications, understanding the trade-offs in large system architecture is something that takes a long time to acquire. So there's plenty for you to learn going forward. Find someone who knows this and start being, uh, get taught by them. Let them be your teacher. Read, read all kinds of stuff. Read books on languages, read books on process, read books on design patterns, read books on design principles. There's a ton to learn out there. Right? So learn like crazy. Make sure that you learn a new language every year. Make sure you are well versed in all the different languages out there and all the different types of languages. Maybe you're a Java programmer. Well, you should definitely become a Ruby programmer then or a Python programmer or a Clojure programmer or a Go program. You should learn these things. Become broad in your experience, not narrow. Okay, Mark, learn how to write. I don't mean write programming. I mean write. Learn how to write. Learn how to communicate with other, other programmers. Learn how to speak and talk and converse. Learn to be a social animal. Most of us programmers, got into this business because, you know, we don't like dealing with people, we'd rather deal with keyboards. Learn how to deal with people, a skill that will pay you back. Enough. Okay. Thank you. I remember that we are li <laughs> limited by the time, so uh, let's try to answer questions from the poll and up to one minute per question. So the first question sure. is, uh, what do you think about changing requirements in the middle of the short sprint development iteration? Someone from the business just realized something. Well, usually if it's in the middle of a sprint, 
it can be delayed until the next print. <laughs> That's the usual rule, right? If the requirements change in the middle of a sprint, you delay that till the next sprint. And don't change, don't change mid sprint. Usually that's the case. Now, sometimes there are emergencies. Okay. Then you cancel the sprint and you start a new sprint. Okay. Uh, according to change of hardware that you've mentioned with the distributed system occurrence, what is important in uh, designing data intensive applications now? What's important about the design of data intensive applications now? Uh, the, the question seems to presume that there is something new about data intensive applications or that there's something new about the emphasis of them. And of course there's not. What's important about data intensive applications is that the data be well structured and well maintained. A good schema needs to be followed. It needs to be properly arranged. Uh, you probably have to refactor that schema from time to time as new behaviors are discovered. But there's nothing particularly new about that. Okay. What is your favorite language now after seeing so many of them? Uh, my favorite language at the moment is Clojure. C-L-O-J-U-R-E, which is essentially a, a Lisp that runs on top of the JVM. Uh, I have come to Lisp in the last 12 years uh, after having avoided it for 40 some odd years uh, and have come to realize that it was, it's a wonderful language uh, and everyone should learn a good Lisp and understand why it is so powerful. Uh. What do you, what do you think a future programmer should learn first, or rather, what is the path of the good programmer? Well, I I think I kind of laid that out in my long series of recommendations to to programmers. Uh, the, the path of the good programmer is to learn and learn and learn as fast possible and get someone more experienced to teach you <laughs> as much as possible. Um, what programming languages are implementing OOP in the right way? What programming languages are implementing object-oriented programming in the right way? Huh, what an interesting question. There's probably only one that implemented it in the right way, and that would have been Smalltalk. And, and the reason I say that is because the author of Smalltalk defined the word object-oriented programming. But the question is not really relevant, because all the languages we have today are perfectly adequate. Well, all, most of the languages we have today are perfectly adequate. Java, SpeechR, Python, Ruby, perfectly adequate for implementing object-oriented programs. So I wouldn't get too hung up on the best one. Okay. Uh, having, having been in the industry for so many years, which advice you would give to a junior developers who are starting up in the industry? Seems like a repeated question, but the, yes. the advice Just again thought. is to learn like crazy and get some older person to teach you a lot. Uh, will GPT-3 replace humans in development? And in general, what you make on, what you take on uh, ML? I suppose it's a machine learning or program. Oh, machine learning, yeah, not machine the language learning. ML. Well, okay. Um, will uh, will, will uh, we reach the singularity, right? Will Will uh, we eventually come up with machine learning that learns how to program computers? The answer to that is no. Um, we will not. And there's a reason for that. And, and that is that human beings are not computers. And we have not found even a hint that a computer can begin to behave like a human being. 
there's no computer that's ever been created. There's no computer that has ever shown any kind of imagination, nor can they. Uh, human beings are very, very different. Our, our, uh, our brains are not digital computers. Right? <laughs> they're they're uh, immensely parallel processed analog computers. So I don't think we're ever going to see that, or at least not in the near century. And let me, let me say that in a different way. Will we have self-driving cars within the next 10 years? And the answer to that is no. Now, we will have cars that can drive themselves in extremely limited environments. We already have those. We may have trucks that can drive themselves on highways because that's an extremely limited environment. But we will not have cars that you can call, you know, on your phone and call a driverless car and have it pull up into your driveway and then take you to the store and then drive away. That's not going to happen because that requires human intuition, human judgment, human knowledge, and you just can't put that into a car. You can't put that into a computer right now. So I'm not too worried about machine learning. It's gotten way more press than it deserves. Uh... So, Martin, I think we have run out of time. Actually, we have. Uh, <laughs> I would I, I would prefer to continue for for at, at least an hour to have a talk with you. Uh, sorry for delaying you for several minutes. Uh, I would say no, thank no you, thank you very much. It's uh, pretty interesting, emotional, and uh, uh, nice nice talk. Uh, I hope our audience also enjoyed talking with you. Guys, sorry for missing some questions. We are limited by the time. We also were unable to ask all questions we wanted to, to ask. And unfortunately, we have no more time. Elena? Robert, thank you so much. It was a great session. And I see in uh, comments that people are writing that uh, just A plus insights and they want a round two. So maybe we'll see you again, hopefully. Sure, that'd be great. Yes. And thank you. Thank you so much. Robert, Very thank welcome. you. See you. Very I hope welcome. to see, see you one more time on Committed. Bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye.